Hello, I'm Christopher Lee. Welcome to Ghosts. Welcome to Hobbs Manor, my friend. Please excuse me for calling you out at such a late hour. I trust you had a pleasant journey. Mark my words, you have an eventful time ahead of you. Allow me to introduce myself properly. My name is Dr. Marcus Grimalkin, and I have devoted my life to the study of the paranormal. It is time for me to decide once and for all whether ghosts are reality or fiction. I hope that you can help me to make this decision. My visit to Hobbs Manor, a house that is world famous for its ghostly activities, is the climax of my life's work. I came here to gather the evidence around me, the documents, films and records that I have painstakingly collected over the years. Make use of the research material that you will find inside the house. You will have to look carefully for it as objects in this house appear to gain a life of their own. Use my findings to make your own decisions. If you join me on my quest, you may be rewarded with great knowledge, but be warned, you may not like everything that you find. When she was about 13, she came down to breakfast one morning and said that she had seen a Roman in a toga in her bedroom. And I thought, oh yes, that sounds a bit far-fetched, a teenage fantasy. But Debbie, later on that day, went out in the garden and was playing and came in with a small coin in her hand, which turned out to be a Roman coin with the head of Septimus Severus on it. So I was quite excited by this because it was quite unusual. And uh, so soon after seeing this Roman in her room, about three months later, 
she had the same experience and saw the same gentleman in her bedroom and she found the second coin on the site and soon afterwards she saw him again and found the third coin on the site. Now all the coins had the same head, the head of Septimus Severus on them. Um, once was unusual, twice was coincidence, three times was a bit more than um, coincidence. And although I've never um, experienced or seen Septimus Severus there at all, we do have funny things happen in the house, like the curtains have been taken down, all sorts of odd things of that nature. And um, I believe that Debbie saw him because she happens to be susceptible to these things. If you want some advice to get ahead, there's more to the laboratory than meets the eye. If you cross the North Downs in the county of Surrey, just east of Guildford, you will come to the tiny hamlet of Shear. Continue south for another mile and you will enter Hurt Wood, an ancient and lush forest on the edge of the Downs. Beneath its heavy canopy of oak and ash, deep in its wooded folds, a clear and tranquil pool will present itself, its banks lined with willow, its rim turning to moss. This is the silent pool of legend, whose lower depths hold a violent and brooding secret. In Saxon times, the silent pool was a godsend for weary travellers who chanced upon it when losing their way in the forest. For Emma and Philip, who lived and worked in the woods, it was far more. It was their secret place where they could forget the long labours of the day and bathe in the pool's placid waters. The daughter and son of Benjamin, the local woodsman, the pair were inseparable, and they had taken over many of the daily chores after the recent death of their mother. Emma, the eldest, was a striking beauty who reminded Benjamin so much of his dear wife. Now approaching womanhood, she would soon marry and raise a family of her own. Philip was a lad of strong heart and limb and devoted to his sister. The household was beginning to recover from the grief that had stricken it earlier that year when the appearance of a dark stranger changed their lives forever. On an uncommonly hot day in autumn, a finely attired nobleman, hopelessly lost and in need of a drink to slake his powerful thirst, stumbled upon the woodcutter's hut. Unprepared for such a visitor, but knowing the dangerous caprice of such men, Benjamin reluctantly entertained him, sharing what little refreshment he had with his taciturn guest. While Philip attended the patrician's steed, Emma served their uninvited caller the last of their water, and then eagerly took her leave to fetch more from her secret refuge. On arriving at the pool, flushed and breathless, Emma felt no compunction to hurry back but instead disrobed and entered the water's cool, inviting embrace. So enchanted was she by the serene beauty of her surrounds that she failed to hear a horse approach until it was too late. The rider burst from the woods and reined in his steed at the water's edge near Emma's discarded clothes, uttering not a word. It was her father's mysterious guest and now she turned abruptly from him, clasping her hands around her naked frame. She pleaded with him for her garments, but the man made no move or sound, merely staring at her with an intensity that terrified Emma. And then without warning, he spurred his mount into the pool towards her. Emma's pulse quickened and she struggled further into the silent waters, though she could not swim. 
The stranger ignored her entreaties and drove his horse forward. Emma now feared for her life as much as her virtue, and so she waded even further into the pool, the waters growing darker and colder with every step, until her toes could no longer feel the bottom, and still the horseman advanced. <coughs> Sobbing convulsively and now feeling a numbness creep up her flailing legs, Emma screamed as loud as her tightening lungs would allow, instinctively reaching out to the mysterious intruder. The rider merely removed a glove and flung it with casual disdain in the direction of the drowning girl's outstretched hands. Emma let out one more frantic yell before her mouth filled with water. Deep in the woods, Philip heard his sister's scream and rushed as fast as his limbs could carry him in the direction of the cry. When he reached the pool, Philip could at first see only the stranger on his steed a short way out from the bank. But then he caught sight of Emma thrashing wildly in the deepest part of the pool. Wading in without a second thought, Philip reached his sister, whose energy had been all but sapped by the icy waters which now enveloped them both. Yet he could not keep her head above water, and his own strength began to fail him. In one last desperate lunge, he tried to push his sister towards the bank, but he fell back under the effort, and the pool's inky depths dragged them down slowly and inexorably. They never surfaced again. The stranger scratched his beard idly, turned his horse, and rode off into the forest. Behind him, the waters of the pool stilled over like a glassy sheet, leaving no trace of the tragedy that took place barely moments ago. When his children did not return home that evening, Benjamin desperately searched for them in all the places he knew they liked to dally, and in time came upon the silent pool, but he could see nothing there, and returned home distraught and tired. He would redouble his efforts tomorrow. And so the woodsman continued his search, time and again returning to the pool, until, on one occasion, something caused him to linger by the bank. The noonday sun was just clearing the tops of the trees overhead, its rays playing across the becalmed surface of the pool, when Benjamin was momentarily blinded by the glint of something bright on the far bank. He hurried around to the other side, but when he got there, what he saw broke his heart, and he wept like a child. There before him, bobbing near the water's edge, were the pale, bloated bodies of his children, still bonded together after death. He waded in and began to pull them back out when he noticed locked in Emma's frozen grip a silver gauntlet, which had to be prized from her fingers for him to look at it more closely. Standing waist deep in the accursed pool with the bodies of his dead children floating beside him, Benjamin examined the crest on the glove and his body shook with helpless rage. For the owner of the glove was not only the self-same lord to whom he gave succor some days before, but also none other than Prince John, Regent of England. His evil was beyond punishment by any other than God, the same God who had now taken his whole family from him. Do not tarry long at the edge of the silent pool, for you might witness the spirit of the drowning maiden rising from her watery grave, a chilling scream on her lips. There she will stare you dead in the eye, and in a heartbeat rush towards you across the pool's shimmering, hushed surface.